All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined from the Dallas-Fort Worth area in Texas by Jessica, the sponsorship lady, Chinyelu. How are you doing, Jessica? I am doing fantastic, John. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be on Sales Pop. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Of course it is with you here. Come on. Um, so Jessica helps speakers, influencers, authors, and event professionals get corporate sponsors. So we're going to talk about today how to land a corporate sponsor. Um, so here's the thing, uh, Jessica. So, I mean, you know, people often think about, oh, yeah, I could see, I could see corporate, you know, big corporations and, and that uh, being able to get other people to sponsor their events. But what about, you know, speakers or influencers and authors, like you say, I mean, how did they land corporate sponsorships? Yeah, that's an incredible question. And I love how we're just diving right in. You know, when you think about corporate sponsors or brand partnerships as an author and speaker or an influencer, what you have to realize is that a lot of times brands or Fortune 500 companies, they have budgets for more than just events. Um, being a part of events is just one piece of the puzzle or one piece of the marketing budget. If you are an author, you now have a way to partner with a brand by um, let's say selling your services or your expertise to their employees. So if they have internal conferences or events, you can show up as the expert and teach their employees and there you go, you have a corporate contract with that brand. If you are someone who is an influencer and there is a new product that this brand is trying to launch, they can now use you through their marketing dollars to promote and advertise this new product that they are launching because you have an audience that they are trying to reach. If you are someone who is a speaker or a coach and you have a service that you teach or, or, or a specific niche um, that you teach on, when you have curricula, maybe you have a course, you can package that course and actually use that content and material to sell to these big corporations. And trust me, they have large budgets for it. Um, and, and they're spending lots of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions of dollars for consultants, for speakers, for authors to come into their companies or on their platforms and share your expertise. The dollars are there. You just have to know how to go about what departments you should be reaching out to, who to reach out to and understand their budgets and how they work. Yeah, no, that, that's a that's a fascinating point, uh, Jessica, because I think a lot of people, if you say like in, in authors or, or speakers, they're they're good. They're good in some ways at, at promoting like themselves and, and the subjects they speak on or their book, but actually target marketing to a corporation or something for to, to do exactly what you're you're talking about here. That that's probably not something a lot of them are familiar with doing. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and we don't think about it because a lot of times when we think about selling our products and services, we think about selling it to consumers. Yeah. And we don't really look at corporations or these big Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 uh, corporations as consumers, but they really are. So there truly is uh, B2C opportun business opportunities when you think about it. And, and you're leaving a lot of money on the table um, as an entrepreneur when you don't think about selling your products, your services, or your gifts to these big corporations. And that's why um, I really try to get people to think about a, an additional stream of revenue for their brand through corporate sponsorships or brand partnerships. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, it's something that uh, people often overlook is, uh, especially if they write a book, right, and it's a business book, is that they think, okay, now I've got to try and sell as many as I can through Amazon and sell to the public, like you said, B2C. But the reality is that most successful business authors, uh, the, the, the greater volume of their books are sold in bulk to corporations doing exactly what you, you, you talked about earlier. But that's not something that, again, that people necessarily think about. Yeah, and I, you know, I love giving real life examples. So I'll tell you yeah. a story about an influencer who actually uh, helped her daughter 
write a book. Her daughter is seven years old and it caught the attention of Neiman Marcus. And wow. obviously with everything that's happening in the world with, you know, our, our social justice issues and, and, and social impact, you have so many corporations that are setting aside very large budgets to bring more awareness to their employees. And so through a diversity and inclusion initiative, Neiman Marcus decided that, you know what, we want to purchase 2000 copies of this book and we want to give this to our employees so that way their families and their homes are talking about other people or races that are not like them or people that do not look like them. And so when you think about that perfect example of you actually pitching to a brand or pitching to a corporation uh, your product or what you're offering to uh, really fill in a gap or help solve a problem or be a solution to a problem, that's one great example in how you can do it as an author or as an influencer. Yeah, and there's a couple of things there that I just wanted to touch upon. Number one is uh, having a corporation buy 4,000 books. Uh, mo most business books or whatever, they're lucky to sell 2,000 over their lifetime. So there you go. You just like doubled that in one shot. So that's amazing. Um, and uh, the other part there is is the thing you ref referenced about different kinds of budgets. Again, you're you're so right here because I think we always think about, oh, do you have an event budget to hire me or whatever? You don't think about, oh, do you have a diversity budget? Do you have what other initiatives? I guess that's a part of it. Is like, is is understanding how to ask what initiatives do you have in the company and what dollars are behind those. Yeah, and very good. So right there. This is a question that I think every single person should ask as you're building a relationship with a brand. So uh, a big mistake that I see some sponsorship seekers make or entrepreneurs make when they're reaching out to brands is they go in asking for the big bucks right away. But the mm -hmm. important thing that you have to do is think about this as a business or an industry that's all about relationship building. And so you have to go in knowing that these are strangers, they don't know me, they don't know anything I've done. I don't know a, a, a whole lot about what they're doing. I've done some research, but I'm sure there's much more internally that could be going on within this company. And so your, your big thing in the beginning is to build the relationship and ask for a phone call. And when you get on the phone with that brand, one of the questions that you ask is, hey, what are some of your goals in the next six, 12 months, three years? And that brand is gonna be able to tell you what they're focused on. How can we develop a partnership to help you guys achieve this goal and how can we do it together? I want, that's how you start to begin getting those answers and figuring out again, how you two can make impact together and see this transformation. But the key thing is, is asking those questions in the very beginning so you can understand how to position yourself successfully in front of these brands. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's, um, that's great advice. And, uh, and I think, yeah, I love the part you also said about not just going for the big bucks, like not just, you know, calling up and saying, oh, you've event, you've event coming up. Uh, can I be the keynote speaker, please? Uh, you know, you might be better off saying, oh, yeah, I see you've got an event coming up. What are some of the what are some of the activities you're going to have? What kind of people are you looking to have in there? You know, maybe maybe doing a small round table or something would be would be better thing to aim for. But as you said, I mean, it's all about getting your foot in the door, getting your foot in the door and getting your foot in the door the right way. Relationships are everything. Sometimes it's just a simple matter of connecting with the person on LinkedIn, what articles are they reading, engaging with the content that they're putting out there, you know, setting it up to where your LinkedIn sales navigator, it shows you everything that they're doing and you're, you're constantly keeping up with the updates about the brand. So that way, by the time you guys do get on the phone, you know so much, you're able to connect the dots and this person is like, wow, I'm impressed. You know your stuff and you, you, you already know what we need, you know? And I think we forget about that. You know, um, people are into this instant gratification because oh. of, you know, Instagram. And that's just, honestly, that's not how this business works. When you think about uh, trying to land corporate sponsorships with brands or these brand partnerships, it's a process. It takes time. Yes, it is sales. But let me tell you, if you get it down right and you do it the right way, you will see some big, big wins. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I'm glad you referenced that about the instant gratification, because I do think that that's uh, that unfortunately, that's the pervasive culture now where everybody thinks if you don't, you know, that everything should come easy and should you know instantaneous. 
And the reality is, even if you take those Instagram people, yeah, you, you see these people who look like they're instant successes, but you don't see the five gazillion other people who weren't. And, oh. and also, you don't even know how, how hard that person worked to be successful. Yeah, yeah. It's so funny because I tell people followers, it's, it's not about how many followers you have, because I get that question all the time, too. Mm -hmm. Well, do I need to have hundreds of thousands of followers or 50,000 followers to get sponsored by brands? No, you don't. If you can show the data, you can, if you're tracking the data and you can show the impact that your event or your program or your book or whatever it is that you're offering is going to make for people, they're going to experience some type of trans transformation, um, then it's going to be able to make sense for them. I tell people all the time, the dollars have to make sense. How are the, is this company's dollars going to translate into some type of transformation or impact? If you can communicate that in your sponsorship deck, in a conversation, on a phone call, it's going to be a win for you. Every, it never fails, works every single time. Yeah, and, and um, I'm glad you also raised that issue about, you know, the sponsorship deck or whatever you're using to, to pitch. Is what, what should a sponsorship deck, in your opinion, what should you include in that? What's, what, what are some best practices? Yeah, so I'm a strong believer in customizing every pitch that mm -hmm. you send out. It should be custom to the brand. Right. Um, and not only should it be custom, but you shouldn't include packages like gold, silver, bronze. Uh, big mistake, don't do it because it's so general and every single brand has different needs um, that you're trying to achieve through the part for a successful partnership. And so if, if I had to say, you know, outside of just the customization, you need to be talking about the who, who you serve, the audience you serve, um, their demographics. You should be including that type of information in there. Very specific data. So um, when I talk about data, I'm not just talking about how old the people are. I'm talking about if you're pitching to Chase Bank or Capital One or MasterCard, you're going to be able to clearly communicate to this brand that 60% of our audience bank with Chase and in 12 to 18 months, they're possibly thinking of opening up lines of credit. These are full-time entrepreneurs, or maybe 30% of them are full-time entrepreneurs. They don't have lines of credit. Maybe they're considering um, getting a loan, taking out a business loan, but maybe they're thinking this may not be the best institution. And you are giving that specific data because you want to be able to prove that there's an opportunity. The next thing that you want to be able to you want to be sure to include inside of your pitch deck is what is the overall problem? What is your goal? And how are you going to reach the goal? And how are you going to help solve this problem? If you can't identify the problem, your goal, and how you're going to reach the goal, like what's going to be the outcome of you reaching this goal, you failed. You have failed miserably. Um, so audience data, demographics. Um, and the outcome, the problem, and how you're going to reach the goal. Those are the key things that need to be there. Obviously, yes, there's, you know, the dates of the sure. event, the program, the product that you, you're putting out there. I think also if you can um, include case studies, everyone is not going to have a case study because maybe this is the first time you're doing something like this. And if you don't have case studies, it's completely okay. But if you do have them, place them there so that way they can see the results of what you've done, like uh, you've been able to do or achieve in the past. Testimonials are also something that's really great to have in there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I love that point that you made there uh, about the details and really um, defining your audience and you know who you help and all of that, because there's always a temptation, especially when people maybe write books, is to think, well, who is your audience? Well, well, my book can kind of help anybody. It helps everybody. And you think, well, that's no, that's great, but that's not a compelling argument, as you were saying, like to chase. That's not a compelling argument to chase because, great, guess what? Not everybody banks a chase. So if your book appeals to everybody, that's great, but it doesn't really help them particularly. Exactly. You got to give us, you got to give the specifics. Um, everyone is not, there's a specific person that is for your brand. Every mm -hmm. single company that you're reaching out to has a very specific audience that they serve, or maybe they have different products that serve different audiences. And it's going to be up to you to figure out like, well, this is a product line within this company that we think would best serve 
our audience. And I think that brand is also going to be able to see that as well if you're able to provide that data and those demographics. Yeah, and I think that there's more chance of you being successful if you just if you make a, if you make some choices and say, okay, this is my target audience, this is the people I go after, you know, as opposed to trying to go too broad. Broad is very tempting, obviously, because you just think, well, the more the more the the bigger the market I can address, the bigger my chances of success. Fortunately, it rarely works out that way. No, it doesn't. And and you bring up a very good point. And I like sharing this. Uh, brands, I bring brands inside of my course all the time. Um, and there was one particular brand, I asked them, I said, what is the one thing that annoys you or is like a pet peeve when you get organizations or entrepreneurs that come to you for uh, sponsorships? And they said, oh man, we cannot stand it when people say, um, we're a good fit for sponsor a sponsorship with your company because our founder and CEO has a million followers on Twitter. And they said, we would much rather work with a person that has a hundred followers on Twitter or a hundred followers on Instagram or a hundred people on their email list, but super engaged. And the impact that's being made is very clear and they have the data to back it up versus the person that has a million followers and they're not engaged. They have no data to back them up. It's just simply, we've got a lot of followers. and. And I'll tell you now, it's, I have seen so many people give so much away, charge $5,000 for these million followers or 100,000 followers, because they, again, they're not being strategic in their ask, but I've seen the person with 500 followers who's been able to get five figure, sometimes six figure contracts because they understand how to, again, position their, themselves and their assets and the sponsorship proposals that they're sending out. So get that out of your head that, you know, I'm this person with a million followers and because I have so many followers, I'm going to be so valuable to brands. It's actually a big turnoff when that's your, when that's the only thing that you're bringing to the table. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And I think people are, are getting more and more wise to the fact that, yeah, you have a million followers, but as you said, how many of those are engaged? And quite frankly, how many of those million followers are anything related to my business or would even be a, a target for my business? And I just wanted to go back uh, to something you mentioned earlier, because I think this is a critical point that you raised here is about doing your research in advance of of uh, engaging with any any corporations or companies looking for sponsorship, doing your research and understanding what's going on there. And that way, let's face it, if you just call up the marketing department and say, do you have any events coming up? Well, they may or may not. But if you've done your research and as you referenced earlier, maybe there's a diversity initiative, probably doesn't belong in marketing. It probably belongs in HR or somewhere, or maybe they've set up a new department with somebody in charge. But if you haven't done your research and then you don't ask the question, oh, I saw your diversity initiative. Who, who's, in, who's running that? Exactly. Research is going to help you save so much time. Um, I would get people, I would say, okay, who's on your prospect list? Who are the brands, the top brands that you want to reach out to for your initiative? And I mean, they would say the most random companies, they're mentioning Coca-Cola, Target, Walmart, Toyota. And in my mind, I'm like, where are you getting these companies from? Why are they even <laughs> good fit? And they're just mentioning these big brands that they've seen be, get sponsored, people, other people get sponsored by. And I'm like, is there even an alignment? Have you even done your research to see if these type of brands, they're sponsoring companies or entrepreneurs like yourself? No, they're not. So why waste your time even reaching out? And that's, again, going back to what you're saying, that that's the reason why research is so important in those, in those beginning stages. Because if you spend time to research the brands that truly align with what you're doing, you're gonna be more successful. You're gonna hear more yeses. You're gonna get more meetings scheduled, more people willing to get on a call with you versus the people who are never responding to your emails or your DMs <laughs> or your pitches because you didn't take the time to do the research on the brands that you truly have synergy with, you know? Yeah, and, and I love that point too about, yeah, you're just going, oh, I'm, I'm gonna go after Walmart. Yeah, great. Or Coca-Cola. Who would you contact exactly? You know, the chance of you getting anywhere close to somebody who could actually be interested in it are kind of slim to none. Um, so to your point, you're better off being far more targeted and places where you actually have, maybe you can get more access to the right people. 
Well, and, and let me tell you, a lot of times people don't even realize, think about the number of brands that are housed under Coca-Cola. There's Smart Water, Fanta, like, gosh, I mean, Dasani, there's so many and it's like, okay, so which brand within Coca-Cola? It's like, I get people who say, I want to partner with Procter & Gamble. Okay, you know how many brands are within Procter & Gamble? Like, let's be a little bit more strategic there because Procter & Gamble is a huge holding of multiple brands and you could maybe partner with one of those brands. You know, they have lots of brand managers for the different brands that are housed under Procter & Gamble or Coca-Cola. So that, again, there's that strategy and the research part. It all goes back to the research. Do your research and that's going to help you find who's the best contact within those brands. And again, even if it's a good fit. And I think the other thing that I just wanted to come back to that you mentioned earlier, I think is an incredibly important point for people there is that idea is that we shouldn't always be just looking for, oh, are they doing some huge event? Are they doing this? Is they doing that? Is looking at what are some of the other things that they do throughout the year, even the small, a small regional meeting or something that, because let's face it, uh, when you're organizing meetings, there's always gaps in the agenda or that people want to do something a little bit different or bring in somebody, but it's not always obvious. So, you know, maybe you're better off uh, like pitching to go to a regional meeting where there's like only 20 people at it, but you have direct access to them. And again, as we said earlier, it gets a foot in the door, but I just want to reiterate that point that you, that you made about not just looking at big events, but looking at, internal events maybe other events maybe they do community outreach but who knows there may be a whole variety of things that you haven't considered yes and and so much of that stuff is listed on the company's linkedin page the different things that they have going on also on their websites what are they doing in the community they share a lot of that information there um, you know, and also just engaging in different human resources groups um, yeah. that you'll see a lot of these, uh, a lot of the people who are employed by these big brands, they're in those groups, they're in the, so they're a part of the associations and that's just another way to connect organically with the brands. Um, LinkedIn is a powerful tool and I highly recommend um, utilizing platforms like LinkedIn. I know we spend so much time on Instagram and Facebook and, and YouTube and those are all wonderful platforms, but I tell people this all the time. Uh, LinkedIn is for the decision makers and the people who cut the checks. And then you've got platforms like Instagram. Those are for people who are like collecting the checks. And so if you want to collect more checks, um, then you definitely want to spend time on LinkedIn for the people who are signing them. So that's beautiful. Great, great way to end the interview. Perfect, perfect. Uh, listen, Jessica, this has been fantastic. So much great information. All of Jessica's information is going to be below this uh, video here. But before we go, Jessica, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yes, thank you so much again for having me, John. I really do appreciate it. Um, I am a corporate sponsorship consultant and I teach people how to land the brand partnerships of their dreams. I have landed over half a million dollars um, in corporate sponsorships for my students and my clients. Um, for myself, I've personally done over six figures in corporate sponsorships for my own events. Um, the best way to stay connected with me is reach out to me on Instagram or LinkedIn at Jessica Chinyelu. And also, if you are really looking to dive deeper into the world of corporate sponsorships, all you have to do is go to the sponsorshiplady.com forward slash training. Again, that's the sponsorshiplady.com forward slash training. And there you will get a free training on how to really land five figure corporate sponsorships. Well, that's fantastic. And I would encourage people to go there. And uh, and maybe you've tried before, maybe you haven't been successful, maybe you've been discouraged. Hopefully, from listening to Jessica today, you can see that there's so many strategies and things that maybe you didn't try yet. So I would encourage you to, to go check out uh, Jessica's work and her training. Uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.